I am honored to introduce our guest, Gabriel Boldeng. Gabriel is doing his master's degree in mathematics education at Le Moyne College in Syracuse, New York. He has received the 2006 Distinguished Student Teacher of the Year Award, the 2007 Bishop Thomas Castello Medal of Excellence in Public Service and Peace and Global Studies, and the 2007 Le Moyne College Social Justice Award. Gabriel has spoken at more than 200 venues, including Cornell University, American University, Mother United States, United Nations Clubs, Amnesty International Chapters, and many others. This evening, Gabriel will walk us through his journey to America from his small village in the south of Sudan to the man he has become today. Immediately after the presentation, the floor will be open for questions. Now, let's welcome Gabriel Boldeng. Let me check whether is my mic working? Okay. Yeah, good evening. I'm deeply honored and most grateful to have this opportunity uh, to be here to share my life experience. And I'm extremely honored uh, to be chosen as a speaker to fill the shoes of women that live an incredible life. Uh, so I thank so much uh, the Fakuda family uh, for their hard work and especially uh, her, her granddaughter, Rachel, for living up, up to the food of her grandmother. So I hope uh, the Fakuda family, especially Neil, uh, Emery, and um, Rachel would not mind if I steal the movement to be one of uh, Kazi children. Because when I read her life experience, she's my mom. Because uh, my mom believed in, in kindness, uh, she's all, she always put other people first. So uh, to, to this evening, I would be speaking of the three people that has been so fundamental in my life, and including uh, uh, Kazu. You see, hope I inherited, the hope was instilled in me by my parents. I have two beautiful and loving parents that the war has deprived me of. So I have uh, nine siblings before the war, two parents, it was a very beautiful life. Like Kazu, my mom believed that your value as a human being is not measured by how much money, how much wealth you have. But my mom believed that your values as a human being, your human worth, is measured in, in how much you give back to your community and how much you care for, you, you care for others. Sudan is, is the largest country in Africa in terms of size, but it is a country, country that has been at war for more than 50 years, way back before I was not born. So I will not really be focusing on the root causes of the conflict, but I would just be sharing my life experience, uh, how the war is affecting the people in southern Sudan, and how the war is affecting uh, the people around the world. That our world should be the most peaceful place, but because of human greed, and because of human weaknesses and ignorance. That's why our, war, our whole world is really in a crisis. I perfectly fit 
the shoes of uh, Kazi because she was a refugee, she came to this country and she really experienced how it like to be in a foreign land. But because with my parent philosophy of being uh, the all you need is to help your friend, all you need is to be kind to others. And I think uh, uh, Ms. Wekin was really so kind and that's why she, she worked hard and that's why she was able to overcome what she had overcome and be able to live such a great exemplary life. So here is because of the Civil War, I just, at age of 10, I had to run for my life, crossing Sudan for four months to Ethiopia. And because of another Civil War in 1990, I had to run again for my life three months into Kenya. And I would like uh, uh, all of you to imagine just in about an hour, you will leave this uh, wonderful uh, uh, gathering and then you go home and could you imagine when you go to your, to your home, that would be your heart, that you will have the keys that you hold now, you open that heart and you go there, whereby there's no clean drinking water, there's, there's no electricity to turn on, and even there's no cell phone to call your friends. <laughs> but my parents believe that you don't need all those things. You don't need a good car. You don't need uh, uh, more wealth. All that is my parents believe. What is important is to have your parents, to have your community, and to have your teachers. And that is all you need. If you have those things, then you are the most wealthy person. So before the Civil War, this is where I was born. I was a very happy child because my mom taught me that what matters in life, what matters in life is how long as you have somebody that cares for you, somebody that is kind to you, that is all you need. So if their life was really good, very good. At age of 10, uh, with nine of us in the family, it would be considered a very large family in America here. Having a nine, nine kids is really very tough, it's very challenging, but my parents tried their best to give us all they can. Because in this particular culture, uh, cows or cattle are very important. Uh, there would be equivalent here to money because the money is so important in this culture that, is, that without money, then you cannot buy anything, you cannot buy food. That is in that specific culture. As a young boy at age of 10, my duty, my family duty was to look after my dad, uh, my dad, my family cows. And every evening, I, every morning, I will go to grazing field. Then in the evening, I would come back. And this is where in the evening, after we had family dinner uh, around a uh, table, this is where my dad would point to me. And he said, Gabriel, you can overcome. You can move a mountain. You can destroy a mountain. And not just a mountain. Just uh, it was the mountain that I had to move and destroy would be mountain Kilimanjaro. Can you imagine your dad telling you you can, over, you can destroy a mountain? So at the age of 10, I say, my dad, you are crazy. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, because how could a human being bring down a mountain? That is not true. So he didn't elaborate on it. My mom taught me not to give up hope and to always work hard. That they would say, like, if we, in, in, the, in that hut that I show you, they say, if we turn up the light, there would be nothing. You would not see anything. But your goal, you are in the darkness. And they say that despite the darkness, you have to work hard with perseverance and with tolerance. And when you work hard through that darkness, then you can see the light. You will have the good light. You will have a good light, nothing. So until 1983, 1987, I was away in the village, and I was just doing my, my usual duty.